<laughs> Hi, everybody. <laughs> My name is Jared. Uh, I am a product manager on vSphere, and I'm one of the co-creators of Project Pacific, the thing that's occupied my life for the past three some odd years. And uh, so today, we're going to talk about Project Pacific. We'll go into a lot more detail than we were able to go in some of the keynotes, and uh, backed up by my friend Mike West, who's going to dig into even more technical detail than I can go into. So without further ado, let's dive into it. So what is Project Pacific? We have a problem today. Developers and only IT one. teams. Yeah, that's, uh, Sorry? No, I'm refreshing. It is, if you have only one problem, it's refreshing. <laughs> <laughs> that's a big problem. So, you know, we talk to developers and they're like, man, my IT department is such a pain. You know, everything's tickets and bureaucracy and it's slow, right? And you talk to IT teams, and you're like, man, my developers are such a pain. Like, they just want to download the latest thing they found on Hacker News and like deploy it in production. Like, how is that a good idea? And <clears throat> You know, VMware, frankly, like we've kind of been part of this problem, right? The, we've created a world where, um, you know, you have all this enormous power in your data center to do uh, things around like security and compliance and governance. But in order to take advantage of those things, you often like have to put that infrastructure behind something like a ticketing system. You have to be in the middle of everything that a developer is trying to do in order to put those kinds of controls on the workloads we deploy. And when we go to like a model where we do self-service and DevOps and let developers deploy their own stuff, the question is, you know, how do you get those same kind of controls? Like, are you going to be there in the middle of every one of your development teams, like chef scripts, and make sure they're putting the right knobs on their VMs to, to, to control things? And it's just too hard. And so we think we can fix this from the infrastructure level. And this is like the mission that we've been on in the vSphere team for the past few years, is really to create uh, a new kind of platform, to evolve vSphere to almost be more of a collaboration platform, to make it easier for developers and operations teams to do their job without getting in each other's way or retaining all the kind of controls that we need over the data center. So what's a workload? So today, you know, when we talk about modern applications, you know, obviously Kubernetes is all the rage. And so we've got our development team building a Kubernetes app. And when we go try to deploy that, the thing is, uh, you know, it doesn't just run, you know, on an abstraction. It runs on Kubernetes, right? And Kubernetes, you know, most typically is deployed on VMs. So right out of the gate, I got to figure out, like, how do I actually run a Kubernetes cluster? And this is, like, an important problem that we'll talk about a bit later. But no enterprise application is this simple, right? Along with this Kubernetes app, I've got some existing application that hasn't been containerized, that it's sitting alongside, that it has to work with, right? So I've got VM-based apps sitting there. I've got databases, right? I've got stateful systems and things that um, don't run in containers or, or need to have lifecycle beyond any of these containerized apps. You know, a lot of the talk in cloud native is about like stateless 12-factor applications, right? And I always like to say behind every 12-factor application is an angry DBA who like made the whole thing work and doesn't get any credit in the world of cloud native, <laughs> right? And then, you know, we even have things like serverless popping up that are like, you know, potentially even something after Kubernetes uh, in a world where we don't even think about nodes or computers or containers anymore. And so we think that like this is like the shape of a modern enterprise application. It's not like containers or VMs. It's all of these things mixed together. But this is really a difficult world to live in, right? So like if I'm a developer, how do I deploy this, right? You can't tell me that Kubernetes is the answer to deploying this application because Kubernetes is just this piece over here, right? So how do I get these other things into existence, right? And how do I manage this? Like if I'm doing DevOps and I'm responsible not just for deploying this application but actually operating it, I need like an ecosystem of tools to, to work with it in production. And if I'm in IT and I have to provide the infrastructure for this, that's also really challenging, right? We see a lot of organizations building up, you know, sort of a dual stack architecture where they got vSphere on one side for their virtualized uh, applications, and then they're building up like a container stack alongside it. But that's problematic because if your application looks like this and it's spread across those two stacks, think about like all the things you're trying to do to that app. You want to secure that app. Well, great, now you got to go secure two completely different stacks that have different tools and different capabilities. You want to take a backup? Good luck, right? Because you got to deal with two completely different siloed uh, uh, stacks. So it's, it's really complicated to try to do this. But the key insight that we had um, was that Kubernetes could actually be a lot more than this, right? So if you, uh, if you listen to Joe Beta talk about Kubernetes, right? We, we think about Kubernetes as a container orchestration system. But Joe does this great talk where he talks about Kubernetes as a platform platform, right? At the core of Kubernetes is actually a design pattern for control planes that's applicable to all kinds of problems, not just container orchestration, but all kinds of orchestration. The core abstraction of Kubernetes is that of desired state. Right, that at the core of the Kubernetes control plane is this database that stores the intent 
of the developer. It says, I want there to be a pod. I want there to be a service. I want there to be a load balancer. And then attached to that database are these controllers that look at that desired state and move the, the, the system forward to try to converge the actual infrastructure with that desired state. And so Kubernetes, the container orchestrator, is a bunch of uh, objects in that database and controllers that relate to containers. But Kubernetes also has custom resource definitions, operators, controllers, and allows me to extend the system to support new types of desired state abstractions. And the insight we had was that we could use that platform, platform aspect of the Kubernetes control plane to actually build a new kind of cloud platform. And so we said, what if you could use Kubernetes not just to deploy a container, but to deploy something like a Kubernetes cluster, or a virtual machine, or a serverless application, or a database? What if you had uh, uh, sort of new types defined in Kubernetes that, that let me say, I would like there to be a three-node Kubernetes, that was a Kubernetes cluster, and that was your desired state? Or what if you had a resource type that said, I want there to be a virtual machine running from this VM template, or I want there to be a HANA database with three nodes? This is the insight we had and the, the effort we took to transform vSphere is to make it into a cloud platform that works off of this model. Right, so this is really interesting from the perspective of a developer. Now, if you think about how a developer consumes a private cloud or a hybrid cloud today, you know, maybe they're using something like OpenStack. And with OpenStack, I can get like a VM or a disk or a network, but then I like create a Kubernetes cluster and I flip over to a different set of tools to use the containers. What this does is this collapses all that stuff together into one layer. Right now, I can use this single, consistent Kubernetes-based API. I can mo model containers, virtual machines, even Kubernetes clusters themselves using this integrated model. And because this control plane is extensible, we can actually add new things to this. You notice I put like a HANA database over here. You know, I, I don't actually have a HANA database feature in vSphere, sorry, but this is uh, uh, the vision of where we're going. But the idea is that SAP can add this. Microsoft can add a SQL Server operator. Uh, MongoDB can add a MongoDB operator. These operators now are an opportunity to extend the control plane of vSphere and add new abstractions that all get unified uh, in, the, in the vSphere system. So really transformative to the developer experience of using the cloud. But there's another aspect here. Earlier I was talking about like the power of vSphere, right? We got things like vMotion and DRS and HA and snapshots, and these are all powerful tools, but they operate at the level of a VM, right? And, and so if I wanted to move this application from one place to another, you know, there might be a dozen VMs in here. Am I gonna go in and do a separate vMotion for every one of the VMs that makes this app? That's really tough. Or if I want to encrypt this application, am I gonna go check the box to turn on encryption on every single one of these things? For most VI admins, it's a challenge just to find all the VMs that make up one logical application. You open up vCenter and you see a list of a thousand VMs in your inventory hierarchy. And so we said, what if we created a new unit of management inside of vCenter? What if instead of managing VMs, you managed logical applications? And so what we did is we took this concept of Kubernetes, another core concept that they call a namespace. And so like a namespace is like a folder, it's a bag of stuff. I can put any of those desired state resource objects in a namespace in Kubernetes. And so we integrated Kubernetes concept of a namespace into vCenter and are making it the new unit of management. So if you think about the things you can do to a VM, we want to make those things that you can do to a namespace. So I want to be able to apply policies to a namespace. I want to set the quality of service that a namespace should get, the quotas on the amount of resources that a namespace can consume. I want to set the security policy of a namespace, the firewall rules, the encryption settings. I want to set availability rules, backup and data protection. I want to set access control rules of like what kind of, what kind of things can a developer do to this namespace. And by doing this, we achieve, achieve two really important <coughs> results. First of all, for a VI admin who was sitting there looking at their vCenter with 1,000 VMs in their inventory, now all of a sudden they're looking at maybe 20 or 30 logical applications, <laughs> right? So it's a massive reduction in the cognitive load on your, on your admins. And it means that they can handle more applications, right? And they, they can spend more time working at a higher level of the system rather than dealing with the minutia. It also means that we can deliver self-service to developers in a much more safe fashion. Because I can, like, for example, if this application is a, you know, needs to be PCI compliant, I can set an encryption policy on this namespace. And I say everything inside here needs to be encrypted. And I don't need to worry about whether or not the developer checks that encryption setting every time they create a container or a VM. That policy is going to apply to everything that the developer uh, uh, creates inside this namespace. 
So it really like amplifies the VI admin, makes them much more effective. And it enables us to do safe self-service because we can govern with policy all the things that the developers do inside this namespace. And this concept of raising the unit of management is really transformative to vCenter.